Ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world, happy Hanukkah, happy holidays, happy world seems to be on fire. I mean, there is a lot going on and we are bringing back a returning champion, a guy to help us through these difficult times and always bring a dose of hope and, and holiday lift. Uh, the, the very wise and very generous and very important, especially in times like this, General Barry McCaffrey is back on Independent Americans. Welcome back, sir. Good to be with you, Paul. Uh, first of all, sir, happy holidays. It's yeah. good to see you. I know you, you usually when you and I are on TV, we're not smiling much, but I got to wish you and your family a happy holiday. Yeah, well, that's great. Thanks for those words and the same to you and your family. And, and building on that, sir, I ask every guest, where are you and how are you? Well, I'm in Seattle, uh, surrounded by uh, all three of our children's families. They're all U University of Washington graduates. The holidays are coming up. We're inundated with cookies and, uh, and growing young adults. So we're pretty pleased with life. And they've got to be pleased with the University of Washington football team right now. I mean, what a team they've got this year. Yeah, Seahawks are having a rough spell, but the, <laughs> the Huskies are just terrific. It's uh, sports has been a good break from the chaos of every day. And I want to go through all of it with you. Uh, this is your third time on the show. So always appreciate you giving us your assessment of all things happening and what's happening next. But maybe we could start with Ukraine. Zelensky meeting with Biden this week in a historic visit. Um, I've been an outspoken advocate for Ukraine. You have and so many others from the national security uh, uh, a, a community. And I think this feels like such a critical point after so many other critical points. What's your assessment of the outcomes of that visit and where Ukraine and America are right now, sir? Well, I, I think we're in trouble. There is no question uh, the, the Ukrainian offensive has stalled. And a lot of it's driven not just by the enormous disparity in resources between the Russians uh, with a population that's 100 million more than Ukraine, uh, not just with the limitations on uh, Western support out of an industrial base, but in both Europe and the United States, it's completely atrophied. Uh, but finally, by the change in the nature of warfare that they're trying to work through. I mean, if you're flying 4,000 drones a month, some lethal, some reconnaissance, a lot of the things that worked on Desert Storm uh, with massed armor moving at 35 miles an hour in the dark aren't going to work. Uh, so I think it's in trouble. Even worse, Paul, in my view, and you know, here's where I am. I'm not a Democrat or Republican registered uh, voter. You know, I, I'm trying to get the best of both worlds and, and see pragmatic solutions. But poor Mr. Biden, who basically is a very experienced and pretty good judgment Secretary Blinken is just absolutely world class and Lloyd Austin's world class. But they're stuck on linkage between the U.S.-Mexican border and aid for both Ukraine and Israel. Ukraine is vital to U.S. national security. If Ukraine goes under, it will put at risk for the next 20 years uh, the security of Eastern Europe at a minimum. Uh, and U.S. national interests, you know, there's only two wealthy places on the face of the earth that we care about, the U.S., North America, and Europe. So I think we're in trouble. And Biden's stuck on this border security, the progressive left. It's insane. If you've got 300,000 people a month illegally coming into this country, who, by the way, I have enormous empathy for. If you're a single mom in Nicaragua or Venezuela, uh, taken 90 days to walk up here at great personal risk carrying two children is what you ought to do. But you got to stop that flow of masses of millions of, of people. You got to stop it by saying it isn't going to work. It's not just border guards and fences. So Biden is stuck in an illogical position. Also, illogical politically, the country doesn't want an open border with Mexico. So I'm uh, very sad about what we're doing. We're placing at risk U.S. global leadership. Primarily, it's Republicans in the House, let's be honest, and also in the Senate. The growing disaffection with, uh, you know, sort of like the know-nothings, uh, 
the 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 work up to World War II, let the Brits fight it out and around. Uh, but we're in a difficult situation. So is Ukraine. They're in great peril. Sir, could, I, I would love for you to please articulate the strategic military impacts the war has had in Ukraine that benefit America. I feel like this is a part of the equation people don't hear enough about. This week, there was you know additional information released publicly about over 300,000 losses on, on the part of the Russian forces. I mean, I've made the argument, many others have, that this is a pretty, uh, maybe the best bang for our, our defense buck we've ever seen without risking American lives. If we would have said to Ronald Reagan, hey, you could degrade the, the Russian military like this uh, without losing any American lives, I think he would have taken it in an instant. But we're in this upside down world where, in my view, sellouts like, like Senator Hawley and J.D. Vance and others are really helping Putin. But, but can you articulate with your, with your experience the, the scope of the losses the Russians have experienced. And as, as a second part of that question, how do we overcome Hawley and these other radicals in the Senate politically who are pent on undermining Ukraine and, and I think undermining American national security? Yeah, it's interesting you pick those two people and there's others, you know, Hawley and J.D. Vance are both extremely intelligent, beautifully educated, aware, experienced, uh, they got a global understanding of what's going on in the world. So I don't know if it's a combination of sheer operatism or trying to suck up to Mr. Trump, uh, who personally is an ignoramus, but these two guys aren't. So they're doing enormous damage to U.S. national interest. You must protect, have security for the greatest concentration of human wealth on the planet, which is NATO, it, fortunately, including the United States and Canada. Uh, and so that's what's at stake. So 44 million people in the Ukraine lose to Putin's criminal enterprise to rebuild the Soviet Union. The next steps, obviously, will be Kaliningrad, the Baltic states, Poland, Romania. And by the way, behind that, our, our military is actually in fairly good shape. At least uh, we've got huge problems, primarily the defense industrial base and recruiting. Uh, but our military is still 2.1 million men and women in the active guard and reserves. It's very capable, very technologically advanced. Europe disarmed. So they need time and incentives to rebuild themselves. So NATO has come together, thanks to U.S. Uh, leadership. They are working on trying to repair the uh, total disarmament that the Germans went from, you know, 7,000 tanks to 160 that work. So their air force can't fly, their navy can't put to sea. The, the Brits can't even field one armored division now in defense of, of, of Western Europe. So there's a lot at stake in the United States and our own national security. If we ignore it, uh, a decade from now, uh, you know, my grandchildren will be in a very uh, different place and we won't like it. Sir, Biden, you know, has, has I think, been uh, really strong on most of this stuff. But there's always that point where he, where he, he kind of doesn't go all the way that I think leaves folks on the left, leaves folks on the right and folks in the middle. I think Ukraine, in my experience, has been one of those examples because it's this drip, 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 drip. Mother, may I, mother, may I, may I have attackums, may I have the Abrams, may I have this next weapon system. And it's put Zelensky in this, in my view, really demeaning position where he has to come with hat in hand and beg, you know, over and over again. And then even on questions like admitting them into NATO, you know, Biden kind of kind of kicks the can down the road on that and doesn't seem to give a strong enough answer. How, how do we reconcile the fact that it feels like, at least especially for veterans, we, we left Afghanistan out in the cold, right? We left so many of our allies there. And now it feels like we're leaving our Ukrainian friends out to dry as well. It feels like we're not standing with our allies when they need us most. And, and it looks to the world like they can't count on us anymore. Well, they can't count on us anymore. You know, but by the way, I, let me make a, one strong point, though. I'm empathetic to uh, President Biden and his national security team in the sense that, you know, I've been in the White House at uh, meetings at two o'clock in the morning where we're trying to determine what course of action is wisest? And when you're dealing with a nuclear armed power, by the way, the only thing Russia got going for him 
uh, our nuclear weapons and oil and gas. That's it. The rest of the country didn't amount to a hill of beans. Uh, but you do have to take into account vertical escalation. Uh, although I would say as an arms control guy, it's highly unlikely the Russians would ever employ a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, tactical nuke. What are they, what's a target supposed to be? What would the consequences be? Now, having said that, though, the president of the United States and 30 other people mash into the uh, national security room do have to worry about that. So there's a point of, of concern that we that we have to take into account. Having said that, you know, there there's a we used to try to say that U.S. foreign policy was determined by CNN or MSNBC in my case. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the idea of the day, the concern of the day is what we talk about and therefore what we do, that we're just reaction reacting to uh, the latest short term problem instead of having a vision, a strategy. There is a good argument that that's what we did with Ukraine. Clearly, clearly, you know, after a couple of years to have no high performance aircraft uh, to painfully, I went in and talked to the Secretary of State about ATACMS, you know, the single weapon system that from the start, and by the way, we got 4,000 ATACMS, 2,000 should have gone to the Ukrainians for deep strike operations uh, to include across the border against any Russian military target uh, that was attacking Ukraine. So I think they've been uh, doling out gradual incrementalism and in providing support to Ukraine. Uh, it, it's hard for me to imagine what they're thinking of. They got 30 M1 tanks. The M1 tank is incredible tool. We have thousands of them. They don't need the latest model. Um, so I, I think your, your comments are well taken. So I, I want to get to Israel and Gaza in a second, but I also want to get to what I think is maybe the most underreported component of this global escalation we're seeing. American troops are getting hit multiple times every day. Now in, in Iraq, in Syria, now we've got naval skirmishes happening. Uh, the Houthis continue to, to attack U.S. <laughs> forces, right? Missile attacks on a regular basis. I think we're close to 100 now. Over 65 Americans have been wounded. I don't know why this isn't more widely reported, but every day America's sons and daughters are getting hit and we're not hitting back, right? Biden has said he's not going to hit the Houthis. We know this is Iranian backed. Um, what do you think should be done about this? Because it feels like we just keep getting punched in the face and we're not allowed to punch back. And that's also welcoming more attacks from our adversaries around the world who see America as distracted, divided, and even weak. Well, I think you're dead on, dead on target the, the whole question that Blinken and Austin and the president have to try and talk through. I got to admit, I, I, I concur with one assessment. They don't want a war with Iran, mostly for political reasons. I think, you know, if we set the U.S. Air Force and Naval Air uh, after the Iranians, they would lose much of their oil industry uh, much of their nuclear weapons program and all their uh, naval capability in the, in the Persian Gulf within 90 days. So they have a lot to lose. And we could clamp down on, uh, on the repressive elements of the Iranian regime, possibly setting in motion uh, political forces that would overthrow these aging dictators. Uh, but I, I think uh, we don't want a war with Iran. It's politically it cannot be handled. The consequences would be enormous to Saudi oil production. Uh, so they're trying to stay away from that. They've stayed too far back, probably. You know, you're right. I, there's over 100 attacks on U.S. forces. I'm amazed we haven't suffered better casualties. Very small 900 troop presence in Syria, maybe three or 4,000 in Iraq, and they're they're very professional and they're very alert to the dangers around them. There is some counter punching going on, uh, but not much. I think at some point pretty soon, uh, they've got to use a hammer against uh, some of these forces. But again, you know, even a, a Hezbollah uh, up in the north of Israel, they've got 100,000 fighters. Uh, they've got 130,000 missiles. 
so the Israelis and the U.S. foreign policy right now to try and keep Lebanon out of the war. It's a powder keg. No one wants it to get worse. I mean, I think all things considered, we're kind of lucky that there's been this much of a lid on it so far, right? Especially when we looked at after October 7th, the way things could have escalated with Hezbollah, with Iran. And I know that that's what Biden and Blinken, and they're trying to keep a lid on this. But I think these attack on U.S. forces, these incidents of piracy, the attacks on ships, I mean, that feels like the part that's ready to explode in a way where if we have high casualties on the American side, he won't be able to keep a lid on it anymore. The American public will require a response. And and as we move over to, to Gaza and Israel, sir, let me ask you, um, Obviously, Israel has a right and an obligation to defend themselves. We've covered it on this show at length. It feels like they maybe overplayed their hand uh, in, in terms of the global public perception and civilian casualties. Um, I don't know if they can put that that genie back in the bottle, but there's this weird, I think, I think uh, uh, failure by the Israelis to articulate well uh, globally, in, in contrast to the Ukrainians, where Zelensky has been so masterful and restrained. It's, I think it's amazing the Ukrainians haven't hit Moscow more often, haven't hit inside Russia more often. This incredible restraint and, and this very effective storytelling. And the Israelis on the other side seem to kind of have lost the plot where they're losing public support. They have a moral high ground that they maybe haven't fully leveraged to the world. And we're in this spot now where Americans are still being held hostage and most Americans don't know about it. So what's your assessment of, of where this is now and where it maybe more importantly, where is it going? Well, I think a mess was a good political science term for the situation and it's not going to get better. It's going nowhere. Uh, there's a deep, ingrained cultural hatred in the part of the Palestinians, and for that matter, most Arabs in the street for the Jews and Israel. Uh, Israel's existence is at stake. They understand that. They were shocked down to their uh, inner, uh, inner DNA by this massive bloody assault. The, uh, the atrocities that were pulled off were insane. They were policy-driven. This wasn't a, a military unit out of control or, or 500 sociopaths that popped up. This was deliberate, provocative terror against the Israeli people. They're going to unseat Hamas one way or the other, if Bi regardless what the U.S. or Biden does. And I think they have to. By the way, one of the things that surprised me is how well the IDF is doing. Uh, they're a great military force anyway, but they're a reserve army. Uh, as far as I can tell, they've suffered around 100 killed in action, uh, which probably means 500 to 800 wounded in action. Uh, and they mostly have got the surface area of, of uh, northern Gaza completely under their control. And now they're in the south. So they're actually doing militarily pretty well. It's been devastating for the 2.2 million Palestinians in an ur dense urban area. Hamas knew that when they pulled off that uh, that attack. So I'm concerned about the day after the war ends, and it will end. And if it ends with a perception in the Arab street and in Palestine that Hamas is still there, still in power, and these Israelis devastated our poor pop civilian population, which they were counting on, uh, then Israel is set up for the next round within a decade uh, that may snuff them out of existence. So actually it won't happen because they've got nuclear weapons. Right. Uh, but if the Arabs ever brought together Iranian direct military power, the Syrian army, uh, Hezbollah's forces, uh, if Egypt said, we're going to sit this one out, the peace truce is over, uh, then Israel could disappear. So I, I'm pretty sympathetic. Now, uh, the use of air power big bombs, 2,000 pound bombs. I think the Israelis are basically trying to collapse uh, the tunnels, but uh, they have uh, wrecked probably half the infrastructure in, in Gaza. They got a limited amount of time. I think within a month, they're gonna stop fighting. And uh, then the problem, the central problem in Gaza is who governs Gaza the day the war stops? It should be a pan-Arab military civilian whole of government, government in a box. It all appears Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. None of that's going to happen. 
Can I can I ask? Can we stay on that for a second, sir? Because I think that's really what maybe is most important in some way. I feel like there's a contrast in leadership. You've got Zelensky, who's talking about what the future looks like, where Kiev is this bustling place, and the world rallies around Ukraine, and we have peace and prosperity. And then you've got Netanyahu, who basically is saying we're going to plow Gaza, and he doesn't say what's going to happen afterward. There's no articulation of of this of this vision for Gaza afterward. And I think he's been extremely ineffective as a leader domestically and internationally. I mean, on a very basic level, is that maybe the most glaring contrast between these two scenarios is a failure of leadership on one side and, and, and a generationally transformative leader on the other? Well, I think you make a good point. Uh, certainly between Zelensky, who's uh, turned into the Churchill of, the, of our time, just a magnificent, uh, along with the rest of his government, including military and political leadership, has been astonishing, sophisticated. Uh, they got internal problems, obviously, but they're magnificent. And, and Netanyahu should have been out of there five, ten years ago. Uh, the war is still going. He has to stay in office until the fighting stops. The one thing I would caution, though, is I don't think the Israelis can pull together in the remotest sense the follow-on uh, action dealing with the West Bank and Gaza. That has to come from regional leadership, and it's not there. The Egyptians are the powerhouse country in the region, the money in Saudi Arabia, the, the professionalism of the Jordanian forces. Nobody's stepping forward. The UN is absent from the uh, from any rational dialogue. So when the fighting stops, which it will, the IDF will be sitting on the ground in Gaza. That means a continuing uh, guerrilla war against the IDF. They can't pull out and say, okay, Hamas, you got it back again. So I think the leadership has to come. And by the way, this isn't our war. Now, I keep worrying about President Biden is good man's owning the war. This is Israel's fight for survival. We ought to stay with them, uh, but we, we don't have to be the one who sorts this out. I don't think it's solvable. We need to tell the Saudis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, and others, you people had better step forward uh, because the next round of fighting may drag all of you into a war, Shia-Sunni war with the Iranians. I, I think that 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 point is so critical. I wrote a piece early on, you know, warning Israel of, of repeating some of the mistakes of America after 9-11. And, and I remember being a part of the you know invasion of Iraq where we knew we were taking Baghdad, but no one knew what was happening afterward. And it seems like the same situation is unfolding in Gaza. And maybe Egypt and the Saudis and, and the Jordanians are are keeping their powder dry. They're watching to see where it goes. They, they, they're, they're, they're keeping themselves out of it because they're not sure how it's going to end up. And China, similarly, just playing the long game and waiting to see what happens with the U.S. and Ukraine and Putin and so many others. But in the midst of all of this, the, 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 where I want to end with you, sir, is focusing on leadership. We've got a crisis of leadership here in America with Biden and Trump up against each other. This seems like it could still go either way. We've got a rise of these potential spoiler candidates like RFK Jr. and potentially others. It's If it was a battlefield, it wouldn't be the blue and the gray. It would be a shark tank, right? This is almost becoming an insurgency in our American political system. Um, we've talked a lot about the opportunity for folks, uh, for veterans to lead, folks like you and the generation behind you. Um, but where do you see the next generation of leadership coming from for America? And who in America can rise to this moment where, as this conflict is happening around the world, America's fighting with itself in a way we've never seen before. Well, boy, you just put on the table, the only the only enduring concern that any of us as Americans should have is the absence of national leadership. And by the way, they're out there. Now, I deal with business and universities and think tanks and the armed forces. I meet unbelievably capable leaders at the age of 40. Uh, you pick up an army battalion commander at random, you're talking to somebody who has a graduate degree, you know, they're tremendously experienced in leading people and making things happen. It is appalling. Uh, poor Mr. Biden, I've known him for years. He's basically a good, experienced guy. He was the most honest senator in the history of the Senate. He was impoverished when he left office. 
Uh, he's too old to be even doing this, for God's sake. He's stumbling around. He should not be running for office. It, you could come up with 250 Democratic potential nominees in 10 days if there was a Democratic Party. And then on the Republican side, they've just come apart. So all these uh, conservative, thoughtful, uh, educated, strong in national defense, uh, people have, have disappeared and they're just irresponsible opportunists. Never mind Mr. Trump. Oh, for God's sake, just take him off the table. He might win. Uh, so the Democrats um, and the Republicans need a new generational leadership. So far, it's not happening. I think we're in terrible jeopardy for the coming 10 years. Uh, we got one party that doesn't understand the Constitution. We got another party that's all over the map on sheer stupidity, border security, crime in the cities. Uh, you know, for God's sakes, uh, we're in a mess. Sir, maybe I, just to, to, to build on that and ask you a question, you know, there's there's no path for independence, something we talk about a lot on this show, right? If someone is country first, if they don't want to go down that partisan, probably a lot of the people you're talking about, those battalion commanders who say, you know, I would serve in government, but I don't want to run for office. I don't want to latch myself with a party. I don't want to put my family through that. I've had so many folks on this show, Admiral Mullen, uh, General Hurtling, Admiral Stravides, you... What 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 would have had to have happened to have all of you guys in politics? How do we get this next generation of guys like you? What is the pathway for them? And Colin Powell and so many others. How, how do we create a pathway so these incredible tested leaders, especially coming out of the military community, do go into politics? Well, we got a lot of captains and master sergeants out there that are the most important uh, political office in the land, by the way, are county, city, and maybe state level, not federal. So American life day in, day out is governed by city councils and the county commissioner. That's where the veterans ought to be stepping forward, particularly people that served one tour in the Navy or the Air Force and uh, they get out and they've had a civilian job for 10 years. And they understand making payroll. That's where veterans can add their thing. I think at a national office, the military guys aren't very good. But we approach a problem. We try and understand it. We come up with objectives. We come up with a mission. What are the required resources? There's a best solution we're looking for that'll work. That's not politics. So I don't. It should know be though, sir. That's exactly what we need, right? I mean that that that's exactly what we need. I mean I told you you're coming to New York. I wish you would run for mayor. I mean, we need, it's exactly what we need. Those things that you said don't work in, po that's exactly what America needs right now on everything from crime to the border to national security. I mean, I just, I always think about how would the world have been different if Colin Powell said, I'm running as an independent and everybody else come with me, right? A generation of division maybe could have been at least impacted. So uh, I hope I hope we can we can still get that. And 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 uh, if I were president, I would pull you into to serve in government immediately. But we need those types of leaders now more than ever, don't you think? Well, we need 40 year old uh, women and men who are running companies, universities, think tanks who have a background in the armed force would be terrific. Uh, uh, but more importantly, who are not career politicians, but do have a political uh, set of philosophical principles. We need a Republican Party. We need a conservative party. Uh, yeah. It doesn't have to look like, I suppose, Reagan, but we need a party not of unprincipled opportunists, uh, but of those who have a, a patriotic vision for America. Conversely, on the left, you know, what happened to the Democrats and the working man? What happened to the, you know, the trade unions? What happened to the concern about Hispanics? Hispanics are registering for as Republicans now because the Democratic Party didn't talk to them about their conservative uh, misgivings about where the crime in the, in the cities are going. I don't know. I think national leadership is derelict. Uh, the only office I would, I'm glad you mentioned that, though, I would definitely come and run for mayor of New York. I love New York. I'd certainly be a fresh face as a candidate.
you, sir, you're the first person to declare your candidacy in the history of this show. So I think if I were Eric Adams, I'd be shaking in my boots and I think you'd be incredibly popular. So if you if you do run, I'll, I'm, I'm all in. But let me ask one last thing. It is holiday time. You're a voice of reason. You're a voice of leadership. You're a voice of clarity and, and a voice of support when people feel scared and worried and under stress. You've got grandkids. Uh, they're they're watching what's happening in the world. What's your message to your grandkids this holiday and to other people and, and grandkids that might be listening to this show and who are worried about the state of our world? What would, you know, Santa McCaffrey, what would Santa McCaffrey say say to, to, to those folks who are listening? Well, you know, I, I t- talk to senior business leaders all the time who get concerned about the new generation. And it's appropriate. You always ought to be worried about the new generation. And they are, you know, they're in social media and they're doing other things. And by the way, the Armed Forces are having a huge trouble with recruitment, mostly because their parents are telling them, don't go in the Armed Forces. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is a terrific generation. They're smart as hell. Uh, they're principled. Uh, they don't smoke cigarettes. They don't act. You know, I, I'm around young people all the time. We just love them. The people we got in the armed forces, are the best soldiers we've ever had in uniform, bar none. Courage, competence, uh, a, a self-discipline that comes from the way they were raised. I just went to a wedding for a grandson. I got two grandsons in the Air Force. I'm very proud of them. One's an Air Force Academy grad. I went to a wedding and just watching that group of people, a lot of them there were in uniform from the Washington Air National Guard. Uh, So I'm a great believer in this upcoming generation, but they do require leadership at the top to set a direction. That's where the problem is. Hmm. Well, sir, every time you join us, it is a gift. And I am grateful for that, especially this holiday season. Thank you for all you do for this country. I wish you and uh, and your family a very, very happy holiday. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah. And, and I am absolutely and totally rooting for you to run for mayor. That would be a wonderful Christmas present for New York City and for the world. So mm-hmm. thank you for joining us, sir, and, and, and all the best. Happy holidays and stay vigilant. Good to be with you, Paul.